Tina koto i nā rangatira o te opi whakauhora. I nā hoa haere, uh, Territorial Leaders, Commissioners Andy and Yvonne, Colonels Suzanne and Melvin, Major Michelle, um, Sharon Selwyn, he mihi whakawhitai, whakawhitai, uh, mō te koto mahi rangatira. I te noha, ana ne te aroha. It is only a small gift, uh, but it is spoken uh, to you in love. We have greeted uh, God and everything that te atua tapu uh, pai tai tai, everything that God questions uh, of us. Uh, we have saluted those who have passed on. And I now turn to you, to those uh, who have gathered, um, to the living faces. We're pleased to see you. Um, it is good to have you in our presence in this space and time tonight. We have said that we're open to the future, uh, to what is still to come. We have saluted mana whenua and the local marae, um, te, ma te marae o oronga mai. And we have greeted our leaders, and we have greeted Sharon uh, Burton and Selwyn uh, Brace Girl uh, from the Heritage Centre and Archives who will be presenting tonight. And we have to simply say a massive thank you to uh, Marissa, uh, to Sarah, and to Caroline for coordinating uh, the display uh, that you are uh, enjoying tonight. Thank you so much uh, for what you've done. Every month, the Booth College of Mission uh, commits this space and time to what we call Thought Matters. It's a public forum where we deliberately hit the pause button and we discuss how our theology matters, how our thinking has material effects, something that our nation is being forced to reckon with following the horrors of the events in Christchurch. The theme for 2019 is the freedom, freedom to flourish, and we will have both internal and external speakers uh, coming to explore how our theology, or what our theology says, and at times has even failed to say, uh, of the freedom to flourish. Tonight, to kick off our forum, we're excited to have the Territorial Archivist and uh, uh, Research and Content Manager of the Heritage Centre and Archives, who will be taking you and I on something of a grand tour of some early portraits of the Salvation Army's uniforms. A great little re resource um, is available for $10. Uh, EFPOS, uh, we will have EFPOS available for you after the presentation. Pause too to offer special greetings to Chris uh, Donnies and Ed Laity, a Salvationist from Atlanta. Um, that's a long way to come. Um, thank you uh, for coming. Good to have you with us. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Jennifer Lee Zotti, a professor in American Studies at Colby College, and it's fascinating how the Salvation Army has become something of an academic object uh, in recent times, and largely because of the work of these people, in terms of their, their archivist uh, work. Jennifer Lee Zotti, uh, a professor, has said this of the uniform. The height of the Salvation Army's popularity coincided with their most effusive use of dress as material evidence of spirituality. It's probably worth repeating. The height of the Salvation Army's popularity, at least in the States, coincided with their most effusive use of dress as material evidence of our spirituality. Kamuha Kamuri. It's a whakatoki uh, that speaks of walking backwards into the future. So what will we learn tonight from this walk backwards into how our dress once, and maybe still, speaks of our spirituality? And even more challenging to consider, what will this past say of how we can think of ourselves in the present and even the future? Uh, Malcolm Ellen Toku Ingoa, no Rera, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Tato Katoa. Will you please join with me in welcoming our presenters from the Heritage Centre and Archives? Gosh, no pressure. <laughs> Thank you for coming out this evening for the launch of the Heritage Centre and Archives Heritage Series. Um, by means of the Heritage Series, um, it's going to be a collection of journals that we intend to share our research to a wider audience and to highlight the extensive collection that is in the Bradwell Room. It's not intended to be seen as a piece of academic work, but more of a publication that will stimulate interest and conversation and to provide a basis for further research. Um, we hope that you'll enjoy reading them as much as we've enjoyed researching for them. 
Um, four years ago, Selwyn and I decided that we were going to make it our mission to share with the Territory the incredible resource that is the Heritage Centre and Archives collection. Because conserving for the future generations, I, we, we pack away our treasures in boxes every day. Um, I pack them in their acid-free tissue paper and then they remain on the shelves. Um, who apart from us and those that work with them will remember them? Um, we considered many different ways on how we could open up to a wider audience um, and what we're privileged to work with on a, and handle on a daily basis. Um, there's an American um, archival theorist, Theodore Schellenberg, and he writes that it is the duty of an archivist to open up research treasures that are entrusted to their care. They should not only accumulate and preserve documentary material, but they should make it accessible to others. We're passionate about our work and we want to share the collection with you, see the artefacts that we handle on a daily basis, share with others the research projects that we've undertaken. We want to make it accessible as a primary source um, for, of our territory's history. We see our work as an affirmation of the value of the Salvation Army's work in New Zealand, Fiji and now Samoa. It's a celebration of the human spirit of people and our nation. We hope, and hope that the Heritage Series will open up a new understanding of how we as a territory have contributed to the vision and mission of William and Catherine Booth. We want to honour the memory of those whose lives have contributed to our heritage. On my office door, down at the Heritage Centre, I have a small poster that reads, Be nice to archivists. They can erase you from history. <laughs> You see, my everyday work, I assess pieces of information if they're of any value or whether they're worth saving, because archives are witnesses to the past, and to a great extent they're an affirmation of someone or something's very existence. They provide evidence and explanation and justification for past and current decisions, transparency and accountability. Archives are unique, contemporaneous records that once lost or destroyed, destroyed, they can't be replaced. If you don't exist on paper, did you ever really exist? <laughs> the ancient Chinese, Greeks and Romans had well-developed archives. Would we know as much about the Roman Empire today if it were not for the likes of Tacitus? He was a senator and historian who provided a key source into our understanding of how the Roman Empire functioned. Living, because, as you all know, living memory soon fades and it dulls as you get older and eventually it's lost forever. However, what we archive today will influence the composition of our understanding of the past and social memory. The Latin word for box is archi, a chest or a strong box used in ancient times as a receptacle for money or valuables. Now, for, you, for those of you that are familiar with archives, it's full of boxes and more boxes. These boxes contain not only documentary evidence of the governor's accountability of the Salvation Army from 1883, but they detail the very existence of those who created them. These documents are not just bearers of historical content, but they reflect the needs and desires of their creators. There's a Maori proverb, kamura, kamuri. It represents the way in which Maori traditionally view the future. The idea is that we're all walking through life backwards. We can't see the future, just as we can't see where we're going. Instead, we look to the past to inform the way we move into the future. We learn from those that have gone before. I, we, owe a debt of gratitude to the likes of Cyril Bradwell, Moira Wright, and Lawrence Hay standing over there in the corner, for without them, the Heritage Centre and Archives would not be so extensive and diverse. Not only do we hold extensive institutional documents, but we are rich in personal holdings and historical artefacts. We look back at what has gone before us on a daily basis. At Archives, we have the privilege of eavesdropping on conversations from 100 years ago sharing the joys of a Kishmit commissioning a hundred years ago, 
and even the excitement of a visit from the founder. To us, these boxes are not full of dead stuff. Instead, they conjure up images of people and events that have gone before us. We may be just a staff of five, but when we go through the door of the repository and the Bradwell room, we are joined by a throng of thousands. Some of these people are around you tonight. Pollard, Mr and Mrs Graham, the Burf Mrs Burfoot, Mariah Morris. You will know their names. Like me, some of you will have looked out of the windows at THQ, across the road to the QC Hotel. And I'm sure that many of you will know that it once belonged to the Salvation Army, and the People's Palace, and before that, the Rescue Centre. But is the name of Annette Paul familiar to any of you? Yeah. Annette was the daughter of an English Army officer stationed in Wellington and converted to Salvationism at Wellington City Corps. We have her to thank for the generous donation of the land and the money to build the initial rescue centre. This one generous act touched the lives of thousands of people over the years. But do we remember her and is she ceasing to be remembered? The provenance of her generosity was discovered in an insignificant box of documents filed away by the Finance Department in 1930. <laughs> and I opened them and found them. And then on a library shelf, we found this small book in a rank of others. It's a Salvation Army songbook, and it's embossed with her name. So without the simple act of clearing out that box from the old Finance Department, the legacy that she left behind could have been forgotten. And this, just some simple things. A small conductor's baton belonging to Commissioner Sadine Goffin. A testament to the reminder of the incredible work of a world-renowned brass band composer and conductor and a former territorial leader. The uniforms behind me here are a contribution of, or evidence of past lives. We have Marisa to thank for this incredible display here tonight. The World War I nurse's uniform, we didn't know we had it. We found it in a box this time last year. Marisa discovered it in the corner. Um, we don't know much about it, but we just know that it belonged to somebody called Miss Baxter. Her name is sewn into the lining of it. Who was she? Sadly, we might never know. But just imagine the hardship and the sorrows that she must have endured on the front. Our publications collection, The War Cry, not only does this hold the history of our territory, but it also tells the social history of our nation. We're currently digitising the early editions, and thanks to Sarah, our digital archivist, these will soon be available for research online as well. And a recent inquiry about the work of the Prison Gates Brigade came in. Um, and it's opened up a whole new research project for Caroline. Um, and a later journal for the Heritage Series will feature the work of the Prison Brigade. Um, for me, there's nothing quite like opening a box that's been sealed for 100 years. Um, will one of my successors in 50 years' time still get that sense of excitement upon opening a box to find out what's in it? Um, with the advent of born digital material, I do wonder if metadata will take away the, the pleasure of handling the tangible. So by means of the Heritage Series, we open up the repository, because as Schellenberg writes, it is the duty of the archivist to share the treasures that are entrusted to their care. And before I hand over to Selwyn, there's a psalm that I quite like, and it relates, to, and we think it kind of relates to archives. It's Psalm 78, verses 3 to 4. I will utter hidden things from old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. I'll hand you over to Solomon. The day came 
not in sepia, not black and white, not even monochromatic. It came in bright colour. For New Zealand, really, it signalled life for the Salvation Army, a Sunday, 1 April 1883. When George Pollard stepped into that Sunday morning, he was gifted a lovely blue sky laced with soft white cloud. After all the preparations, he must have been pleased that the way was clear for crowds to respond to the advertising and news about the Salvation Army that had proceeded. And so the open airs and meetings commenced. The next day, Monday the 2nd of April, the Otago Daily Times, with more than 1,500 words, reported on these colourful events. This is how the article began. Uh, the detachment of the Salvation Army commenced operations yesterday in the Temperance Hall, which has been occupied as the headquarters or barracks here. Captains Pollard and Burfoot wore the Army uniform, dark tweed with scarlet facings, and also the Army badge, a shield bearing the motto, Blood and Fire. They are both young men, evidently thoroughly in earnest and full of faith in the, the success of their mission. As may be expected, they are not polished speakers, but they have a rough and ready style, a determined manner, and the ability to deliver their message in a simple, straightforward, and withal impressive style. Scarlet facings. When you look closely at the photo of George and Alice Pollard, taken at the end of 1883, and assuming this is the uniform he wore on the 1st of April, the facings are likely referring to the cap band, the collar, and possibly the diagonal embroidered strips on the cuffs. But let us briefly move forward in time by 135 years, plus a few months, to July 2018. I was in the BCM library in conversation with David Wells. When he made the comment to the effect, wouldn't it be great if someone wrote a history of the Salvation Army uniform? <laughs> My immediate response, it sounded like a life's work and dismissed the idea. Well, not completely, because I did think of all the wonderful historic images we had in the archives collection and realised we might be able to at least put together an album of interesting images. And so was born Uniform Portraits. Except it ended up being a little more than a photo album. Realising the richness of information stored in archives about soldiership and uniforms, it was realised this source material could be made available published with photographs from the collection. So this material has been brought together, focused on the first 30 years of the Salvation Army in New Zealand. In reality, it only scratches the surface of the subject, even for that short time. The first orders and regulations for the Salvation Army were published in 1878, then reprinted in 1881. It is interesting to note that a Trade Department advertisement in the New Zealand war cry of 4 October 1884 includes in its price list orders and regulations, which will be the 1881 reprint. But it has by way of a descriptor in brackets, so-called secret book. <laughs> the subject of the secret, so -called, secret book, so-called, is addressed in 1883 by Catherine Booth in her book, the Salvation Army in relation to church, the church and state. The appendix on page 87 is headed, The Secret Book, so-called. Here are some excerpts. A few words about the so-called secret book. And first, there has been endless confusion as to which book has been thus designated. Please note that we have two small books, one entitled Orders and Regulations, and the other one, Doctrine and Discipline. And these are the only books of this character ever published. 
The five other parts referred to in orders have not been written. Secondly, please note that the book referred to in Mr Charlesworth's letter in the Times was not the orders and regulations, as his own words prove. After giving his own monstrous assertions as to our teachings, for which there is not a word of justification in either book, he says, I challenge you to make that book public, not the book to which you refer when these orders are spoken of, which is only the general orders and regulations for the members of the army, but the book given to your trusted, initiated officers for their guidance and instruction, with an express direction not to show it. <laughs> this book is the doctrine and discipline, which, by the way, you can get for sixpence anywhere. <laughs> I repeat, we have only these two books. With respect to this little book, I want you to note first that it is a catechism prepared specially for our cadets of the simplest and most under understandable nature, setting forth our doctrines. Secondly, that it is never a secret book, the sense our enemies insinuate, but we, knowing that some of our views would differ from those of many Christians, did not wish to be brought into collision by making the pub book public, and so at first it was confined mainly to our offices. But for some time now, it has been sold at all our stations. To explore this further, read The Salvation Army in Relation to Church and State. So far we have been unable to view the first orders and regulations of the Salvation Army. A delicate, a very delicate copy exists at the International Heritage Centre, but is not digitised as of yet. What might that say about the uniform? On 3 January 1891, the New Zealand War Cry published an advertisement for orders and regulations for soldiers of the Salvation Army, described as this long felt want will at last be in the hands of the Corps throughout New Zealand. We ought to rejoice. There are rules and regulations for commissioning colonels, majors, staff captains, captains and lieutenants. But hitherto a soldier has not been able to turn to anything for explanation as to his duty when there has been no captain to tell him. This great need is now met. And one of the most interesting, instructive, simple and complete books that ever the general issued can now be got. They ought to sell in shoals. Our first supply only amounts to 1,000. The big core will soon run away with this lot. Get one. <laughs> well, archives would like to get one. We don't have a copy. Australia have the same, had the same advertisement in their war cry around the same time, but the Melbourne Heritage Centre does not have a copy either. In fact, the International Heritage Centre have no record of such an issue. For the moment, it is a mystery. More investigation is needed. However, we managed to get a copy of the 1899 O's and R's for soldiers from Melbourne. Here is an excerpt. Section 11, uniforms. Number 11, point 11. No male soldier can be considered in full uniform unless he has on at least a red guernsey, an army cap with red band, and brass S's on the collar of his coat or jacket. And every female soldier in full uniform must wear at least a hallelujah bonnet with a red band round the trimming and a dark blue dress of serge or some similar cut as plain as possible. The real emphasis is on the symbols of the Salvation Army. An earlier point states, number nine, soldiers should, if possible, wear some ribbon or badge or other sign of soldierhood when at their daily employment. Tricolour ribbon. There is an extraordinary story here in searching our photographic record for the 1883 to 1913 period, we began to discover many portraits with a common feature, a ribbon attached to the tunic, notably through the 1880s and 1890s. 
First, there was uh, George Pollard in 1883, and his is tucked around the button <coughs> from his buttonhole and back inside the tunic. Elizabeth Wedge, who was an early day officer. Uh, while most men, mostly men, wore this feature, some women did too. Captain Donald Graham, tricolour ribbon. An unknown Wellington Salvationist, tricolour ribbon. Also a great uh, Guernsey under there with probably a homemade uh, crest. Another unknown Salvationist, and you can just see the tricolour ribbon below the bow in the middle of the photo there. And another one from Wellington, the ribbon again. The archives collection is full of portraits with the tricolour ribbon featured, and even some group photos where some are wearing the ribbon. The amazing thing is, it seems to have only occurred in New Zealand, despite the fact that orders and regulations encourage the wearing of the ribbon. The International Heritage Centre cannot find images like the New Zealand ones with the ribbon worn here. In Melbourne, we're only able to locate uh, one or two group photos where the ribbons were worn hanging down. Uh, and in New Zealand, that, that happened as well. However, it seems the tricolour ribbon attached to the tunic edge is a uniquely significant New Zealand occurrence and will be worthy of further investigation. And that is why we have made available simulated tricolour ribbons, colour printed on one side only, though, but on non-tear paper. So that's why you've got an example. Advertising. When the second issue of the... <laughs> no, just don't get too excited. <laughs> When the second issue of the weekly New Zealand War Cry was published on the 23rd of June, there appeared, in 1883, there appeared the first advertisement for uniforms. So there you go. A number of pages in uniform portraits are dedicated to the advertising of uniforms and related material by the Trade Department over a 30-year period. And yes, there were even advertisements which offered underpants for sale, all wool. So are you feeling a bit itchy just thinking about that? And perhaps, perhaps not quite like these yellow, red and blue possibilities. And then numerous advertisements for bonnets appeared. This one for a new summer bonnet. Then there was the smart looking jacket for men, notably used by some of the brass bands. Shower proof coats for ladies, styles the favourite or the Canterbury. The Canterbury is available in black Italian cloth or red cashmere. You were reminded to supply your measurements. Uh, for the undress uniform, <laughs> for the undress uniform, summer blouses are available in maroon cashmere and tussle silk. So here are some quotes from uniform portraits. So among questions to Colonel Bailey, Commander New Zealand Division, or also referred to as Colony, Colony Commander, in the war cry of 20 June 1891, question, why does the army lay such stress upon uniform wearing? Answer, because uniform provides the easiest method of openly avowing oneself to be a follower of Jesus Christ and belonging to his people. It is also a safeguard against much temptation and is a positive denial to the fashions and vanities of the world. A blood and fire soldier says in the war cry, 27 June, surely it would be far better to exalt the privilege of uniform wearing to impress every recruit with the idea that they must claim the power to live holy and consistent lives and go forth conscious of the reception of that power ere they aspire to be uniform wearers. Or P.S. of Fongaray in the War Cry 5 April 1902 suggests a word to the sisters. We cannot help but notice how the fancy watch chains, ornamental cufflinks 
and dainty blouses are taking the place of the plain ones. In many little ways, we are driving in the thin end of the wedge, for such it is. <laughs> a report from Rahatu in the war cry of 18 October 1902 states, Soldiers are in good fighting trim. A number of the Maori comrades have got into full uniform. Five backsliders, including Europeans, have been restored to the saviour, and a young lad has sought and found salvation and is keeping well saved. Bless God. The daughter of William and Catherine Booth, Catherine or Kate, says the following in the New Zealand in the war cry of 5 February 1887. In speaking upon the subject of uniform, I wish all to understand that it is not only by what we wear that we desire to be known as being on Christ's side, but also in all that we say, by the way we live, and even in our eating and drinking. <coughs> so here's a little portrait gallery from uniform portraits, and maybe one or two other images as well. So here's William Beats with his red Guernsey. Sarah Sterling. It's a wonderful bonnet and bow, isn't it? Look at the size of the bow. On the right is an example of the Norfolk jacket with the waist strap, which was quite common in the 1880s and 1890s. And the tricolour ribbon makes an appearance again. Now, I'd love to see this one in colour, just to discover the colour of her dress and bonnet, as light in colour as they appear. Again, a hint of the tricolour ribbon on his tunic. You can just make it out there. The Dunedin Timbrel Band of 1898 is a good example of how dresses can vary in style when you look closely. Shop bought, homemade, and no doubt some from the trade department. Rescue home workers in formal dress in 1900. The Omaru Corps Band in 1902. Now they're not all identically dressed, but looking smart. They even have a violin, banjos, and an auto harp. Then the Christchurch Corps Band in 1908. Um, they have a very formal uniform and yet a number are wearing plain uniforms. Maybe one or two of those are officers. Here's an undated photo of the Otaki Corps. And the first Salvation Army Band in New Zealand was formed by Dunedin No. 1 Corps in 1883. And... Uh, some Gisborne cadets and officers under the leadership of Ernest Holdaway. What a great array of bonnets. Generally speaking, over the first 30 years, the uniform became more uniform, but in the beginning, the tunics, dresses, etc., varied considerably. But if you had a Guernsey, S's, shield badge, bonnet, or cap, etc., along with a plain serge like dress or tunic, you were regarded as being in uniform. The 56 pages of uniform portraits presents a lot of primary source material. Any written text is hopefully drawing your attention to that material. It is not intended as an academic work, but hopefully helpful to academic endeavour and general fascination. There is an article from an 1891 war cry included in uniform portraits <coughs> entitled Soldiership. Actually, just an excerpt from the article. Because the soldiership subject was included over several war cry issues, we have published all these articles together as Heritage Series 2. Salvation Army Soldiership Symposium, June, July, August 1891. The 1891 readers of the war cry were invited to write letters to the editor about soldiership. The first issue was headed, Soldiership, an important subject. Wanted Hallelujah Press Gangs, How to Stop the Leakage, <laughs> Free Discussion Invited, Ventilate Your Ideas. How could you resist an invitation like that? Well, people didn't. So their contributions can be found in Heritage Series 2. 
and is free with each copy of Uniform Portraits purchased tonight. <laughs> Soldier's Boom Song appears at the end of the publication. And here is a verse and chorus to the tune, <coughs> We're the Army. Oh, how many in the ranks today are joyful that ever they obeyed the voice of God. Clad in cap or bonnet, S's shield or ribbon, gladly thus they go and tell of Jesus' blood. Oh, for soldiers who will conquer and will face the fiercest storm, fearing neither hurt nor harm, but onward marching and never flinching, forth will go and do great deeds in Jesus' name. <laughs> You get the idea. <laughs> coincidences, if you believe in coincidences. There is a photograph in archives of some old identities of the Salvation Army taken in 1933. Many who were present when it all started in 1883. It was taken outside the Wellington City Corps during the Jubilee celebrations 50 Years of the Salvation Army in New Zealand. The photo features in the latest archives newsletter, Revelations 5. Coincidence 1. While looking for the relevant war cry article about the photo, I discovered an article titled 50 Years of Field Activity in Maoriland, one of many in the Jubilee year. The amazing thing about this Jubilee article was the relevance of the historical perspective to uniform portraits. You'll hear a little bit more about that. Coincidence two. Then it was realised the only other article on the page had already been scanned by us last year in preparation for another Heritage Series publication on the written works of one of our incredibly capable early officers John Hultquist. Look out for his story when it is published. Because of this, we have made copies of this page, which are also available tonight if you'd like a copy. <coughs> Uniform Portraits is a, a little bit quirky, square format, bits and pieces brought together, and there is no final written statement because that comes in the form of a scanned excerpt from that article, 50 Years of Field Activity in Maryland, written by Lieutenant Colonel Burton. And this is what he writes. An attempt to visualise the history of the Salvation Army in New Zealand suggests the necessity of dividing the period into epochs. First, the introductory 10 years, so full of evangelism and leading to such a volume of seekers that that consideration in itself occupied entirely the attention of the small band of officers whose efforts were backed not only by a people filled with a newfound eagerness to serve Christ, but also by the cream of the religious life existing in New Zealand. It's interesting. Secondly, consolidating and organising the work in harmony with the army idea was in itself somewhat revolutionary. And when it became evident that the military idea was to impregnate every phase and that a uniformed and disciplined force operating for God and souls was in itself a fixed principle, many of the helpers associated with the first 10 years commenced to feel that they had reached, to all intents and purposes, the parting of the way. Many of these good people taking part in our meetings then found in themselves a hesitancy about going all the way in the matter of soldiership. While this phase was important and necessary to the formation of a fighting force, to be in itself something quite different to any existing religious order, it nevertheless presented its difficulties and robbed the work of very valuable assistance enjoyed over the first period. Many of these valued friends were heart and soul in the evangelism of the movement, and accepted fully 
the evangelical truths used, but they were neither acquainted with nor appreciative of, in most cases, the more militant idea. And tonight I would like to just finish with a quote from earlier in that article. Sometimes we, sometimes we hear the suggestion that in those early days anything in the way of happy-go-lucky, slipshod methods met the case, arrested the attention of the people and paved the way to the mercy seat. Nothing, however, could be wider of the mark. The first people attracted to the Salvation Army in all parts of the country were men and women of standing and Christian character, people who had thirsted for a living exemplification of Bible holiness and who had looked for apostolic accomplishments and longed for their repetition. These very people, Bible students, local preachers, lay readers, restored backsliders threw themselves into the movement, cooperating with the early officers in meetings and efforts to teach the young converts. Many of these became officers. During these first ten years, they came into the fighting line throughout the country, people with qualifications for the exposition of Bible truth, and the whole structure was built on a sound Bible foundation and included the enunciation of the highest Bible standards. Wow. To discover more, you will need to read Uniform Portraits, Soldiership Symposium, and Lieutenant Colonel Burton's article, 50 Years of Field Activity in Maoriland. Thank you very much.